Hi everyone, my name is Bulong Burmese, director of the Emily Taylor Center. Today we're going to be reading um, Hunger by Roxane Gay for the Free Black Women's Library Reading Challenge. Um, we've been doing this challenge for the past year, um, since I think January, February, um, and we'll be continuing it throughout the year, um, through the end of the 2021 year. So I'm super excited to be reading this book. Um, I read this book when it first came out and it was transformative to say the least. Um, just a beautiful memoir um, by Roxane Gay um, of her body and her experience. Um, for those of you who might tune into this, I do want to give a content warning that um, this book does talk about sexual violence, rape, um, fat phobia, um, obesity, um, and so if you need to take care of yourself, um, if you need to prepare yourself to hear some of this story, um, just know that this is present in this book. So I'll begin. Um, and as people join in, I might pause and give other uh, content warnings. So, um, this is Hunger, a memoir of my body by Roxanne Gay. When I do these readings, I like to jump around. So I'm actually going to unconventionally start with part one, chapter one, um, and then we'll move around the book. Everybody has a story and a history. Here I offer mine with a memoir of my body and my hunger. The story of my body is not a story of triumph. This is not a weight loss memoir. There will be no pictures of a thin version of me, my slender body emblazoned across this book's cover with me standing in one leg of my former fatter self's jeans. This is not a book that will offer motivation. I don't have any powerful insight into what it takes to overcome an unruly body and unruly appetites. Mine is not a success story. Mine is simply a true story. I wish so very much that I could write a book about triumphant weight loss and how I learned how to live more effectively with my demons. I wish I could write a book about being at peace and loving myself wholly at any size. Instead, I have written an experience. I have written this book, which has been the most difficult writing experience of my life. One far more challenging than I could have ever imagined. When I set out to write Hunger, I was certain the words would come easily, the way they usually do. And what could be easier to write about than the body I have lived in for more than 40 years? But I soon realized I was not only writing a memoir of my body, I was forcing myself to look at what my body has endured, the weight I gained and how hard it has been to both live with and lose that weight. I've been forced to look at my guiltiest secrets. I've cut myself wide open. I am exposed. That is not comfortable. That is not easy. I wish I had the kind of strength and willpower to tell you a triumphant story. I am in search of that kind of strength and willpower. I am determined to be more than my body, what my body has endured, what my body has become. Determination though, has not gotten me very far. Writing this book is a confession. These are the ugliest, weakest, barest parts of me. This is my truth. This is a memoir of my body because more often than not, stories of bodies like mine are ignored or dismissed or derided. People see bodies like mine and make their assumptions. They think they know the why of my body they do not. This is not a story of triumph, but this is a story that demands to be told and deserves to be heard. This is a book about my body, about my hunger, and ultimately, this is a book about disappearing and being lost and wanting so very much, wanting to be seen 
and understood. This is a book about learning, however slowly, to allow myself to be seen and understood. The first two chapters. These are very short chapters and it's a very um, easy book to read um, in terms of the way it's written, but obviously difficult to read in terms of the content. Um, once again, I want to remind folks that this book does talk about obesity, um, but also sexual violence and rape. Um, and so if you need to take space or pause this, um, if you're watching this back, uh, please remember that this does cover um, some heavier topics um, that might trigger, um, trigger people. I'm going to continue and go um, right to chapter five. Um, and probably head into chapter five and six. They're very short. This is five right here. Um, and then we'll bounce around to a couple more chapters. What you need to know is that my life is split in two, cleaved not so neatly. There is the before and the after. Before I gained weight, after I gained weight before I was raped, after I was raped. In the before of my life, I was so very young and sheltered. I knew nothing about anything. I didn't know I could suffer or the breadth and scope of what suffering could be. I didn't know that I could give voice to my suffering when I did suffer. I didn't know there were better ways to deal with my suffering. Of all the things I wish I knew then that I now know, I wish I had known I could talk to my parents and get help and turn to something other than food. I wish I had known that my violation was not my fault. What I did know was food, so I ate because I understood that I could take up more space. I could become more solid, stronger, safer. I understood from the way I saw people stare at fat people from the way I stared at fat people, that too much weight was undesirable. If I was undesirable, I could keep more hurt away. At least I hoped I could keep more hurt away because in the after, I knew too much about hurt. I knew too much about hurt, but I didn't know how much more a girl could suffer until I did. But this is what I did. This is the body I made. I am corpulent. Rolls of brown flesh, arms and thighs and belly. The fat eventually had nowhere to go. So it created its own paths around my body. I am riven with stretch marks, pockets of cellulite on my massive thighs. The fat created a new body. One that shamed me, but one that made me feel safe. And more than anything, I desperately needed to feel safe. I needed to feel like a fortress, impermeable. I did not want anything or anyone to touch me. I did this to myself. This is my fault and my responsibility. This is what I tell myself, though I should not bear the responsibility for this body alone. Roxane Gay is just one of my favorite authors. Um, she's also an amazing cook, if you follow her on Instagram. Um, she often shares her meals, um, and she's really funny. And I had the pleasure of meeting her a couple years ago um, at a conference, and um, it was amazing. So I am going to go to chapter eight, um, and then we might move towards the middle of the book. Um, and then um, finish with the end of the book. Like I mentioned, these are very, very short chapters. Um, and so it goes all the way up to chapter let's see, 80, 89, 88. So they're very short. So we're on chapter eight. In writing about my body, maybe I should study this flesh the abundance of it as a crime scene. I should examine this corporeal effect to determine the cause. 
I didn't want to think of my body as a crime scene. I don't want to think of my body as something gone horribly wrong, something that should be cordoned off and investigated. Is my body a crime scene when I already know I am the perpetrator or at least one of the perpetrators? Or should I see myself as the victim of the crime that took place in my body? I am marked in so many ways by what I went through. I survived it, but that isn't the whole of the story. Over the years, I have learned the importance of survival in claiming the label of survivor, but I don't mind the label of victim. I also don't think there's any shame in saying that when I was raped, I became a victim. And to this day, while I'm also many other things, I am still a victim. It took me a long time, but I prefer victim to survivor now. I don't want to diminish the gravity of what happened. I don't want to pretend I'm on some triumphant, uplifting journey. I don't want to pretend that everything is okay. I'm living with what happened, moving forward without forgetting, moving forward without pretending I am unscarred. In this memoir of my body, my body was broken. I was broken. I did not know how to put myself back together. I was splintered. A part of me was dead. A part of me was mute. And I would stay that way for many years. I was hollowed out. I was determined to fill the void. And food was what I used to build a shield around what little was left of me. I ate and ate and ate in the hopes that if I made myself big, my body would be safe. I buried the girl I had been because she ran into all kinds of trouble. I tried to erase every memory of her, but she is still there, somewhere. She is still small and scared and ashamed, and perhaps I am writing my way back to her, trying to tell her everything she needs to hear. Thanks y'all for joining. I know a couple more folks came in. We're reading um, Hunger by Roxane Gay, a memoir of her body. Um, and this is part of the free Black Women's Library Reading Challenge that we started earlier this year. Um, black women at KU are picking books in various categories um, to read. And this week we are reading a memoir. Um, and I chose Roxane Gay. So. I'm going to head towards the middle-ish of the book, um, and then we'll head maybe towards the middle. All right. Chapter 23. Throughout high school, I went through the motions, pretending to be the good student at school and the good daughter when I was talking to my parents, as my mind continued to splinter. With each passing year, I became more and more disgusted with myself. I was convinced that having been raped was my fault, that I deserved it, that what happened in the woods was all a, path a pathetic girl like me could expect. I slept less and less because when I closed my eyes, I could feel boy bodies crushing my girl body, hurting my girl body. I smelled their sweat and beer breath and relived every terrible thing they did to me. I would wake up gasping and terrified and would spend the rest of the night staring at the ceiling or reading myself out of my body and out of my life into something better. There was no rhyme or reason to what I read, lots of Tom Clancy and Clive Cussler for the pure escape they provided, Harlequin romances because they were so bountiful, whatever I could find in the campus library. During the day, I went to class, which was, in its way, another kind of escape. Academically, Exeter was intense, way more rigorous than my college classes would ever be. I loved my classes. In architecture, we had to build a vessel that would keep an egg safe if we dropped it from the roof of the building, but we could use only like styrofoam and rubber bands. In an English class, every upper or junior to the rest of the world had to write a reporter at large essay, an in-depth project for which we had to do research and interview sources and immerse ourselves in a topic that interested us. Back then, I wanted to be a doctor, one of the Haitian parent approved professions. So I wrote about a surgeon who was my family's next door neighbor. 
He was patient with my questions and allowed me to observe a surgery over spring break. While I worked on my reporter at large, I felt like I was so much more than a lame high school student. I did well academically. That's how I'd been raised, to be excellent, to never be satisfied with anything less. A B was a bad grade, and if I received an A minus, I could still do better. So I did better. I did my best. I was always very high strung about school for many reasons, not the least of which was a pressure to perform and the comfort of knowing that schoolwork, at least, was something in my control. I knew how to study and memorize and make sense of complicated things, as long as they had nothing to do with me. I also knew how much money my parents were spending on my education, and so I could not fail. I could not let them down in one more way. I needed in some small way to feel worthy of their expectations of me. I became more and more detached from my body, continuing to eat too much and gain weight. I only tried to lose weight when my parents made me or nagged me enough to give dieting a half-hearted try. I didn't care about getting fat. I wanted to be fat, to be big, to be ignored by men, to be safe. During the four years of high school, I probably gained 120 pounds. I racked up incredible bills using my Lion card, the school currency system, buying so much food at the grill, buying random crap at the school bookstore because there was a rush of solace when I ate or spent money. As I spent all that money, I was also probably trying to keep up with the wealthy kids around me who had their own American Express cards that they used extravagantly on the weekends in Boston and exotic trips over break to Europe and to Aspen. My parents would confront me about the bills, furious at the waste of money, wanting answers for every expenditure, but really wanting answers for who I had become, so different from the daughter they thought they knew. I had no answers for them. I was all self-loathing for what had happened to me, for what I was doing to my body by gaining so much weight, for my inability to function like a normal person, for the ways I was plainly disappointing my parents. I still nourished my commitment to being the geekiest drama geek ever to drama geek. My senior year, some friends and I wrote and produced a play on sexual violence. We all had experiences with assault that we had shared in one way or another over the years. On opening night, my parents were in the audience and after, when I found them in the lobby, their bewilderment was palpable. They asked me how I could have come up with such a thing. It was an opportunity for me to tell them the truth of me, but I shrugged off their question. I continued holding tight to my secret. By the time I had decided where to attend college, I knew I had to do whatever I could to make my parents happy, to make up for being who I was, for being a disappointment. I dutifully applied to colleges, mostly Ivy League schools and NYU. I got in everywhere except Brown University, a slight I have clearly never forgotten. I got my acceptance from Yale in the post office at school, surrounded by other seniors who were equally eager to find out what their futures might hold. I opened the envelope and allowed myself a flush of pride. A young white man standing near me, the kind of guy who played lacrosse, had not been accepted to the school of his choice. He looked at me with plain disgust. Affirmative action, he sneered, unable to swallow the bitter truth that I, a black girl, had achieved something he could not. If I had to go to college, and as a Haitian daughter, I had to go to college, I wanted to attend NYU which had an incredible theater program. Unfortunately, my parents were adamant that it would be too distracting for me to go to college in New York City. And majoring in theater was too unrealistic, too fanciful. The final nail in the coffin of my yearning was their worry that the city was too dangerous, a concern that frustrated me immeasurably because I knew where danger really lurked in the woods behind well-manicured exclusive suburban neighborhoods at the hands of good boys from good families. As much as I wanted to attend NYU, what I wanted even more was a break, a chance for all the noise in my head to quiet. I asked my parents if I could take a year off because I knew I didn't have it in me to keep up appearances for much longer. I was a mess, barely holding it together, 
but my request was refused. Taking a year off between high school and college was not what good girls did. It never crossed my mind that I had no choice in the matter once I was told no. I ended up choosing Yale because they had an incredible theater program and I wanted to work at the Yale uh, drama like Jodie Foster had. New Haven was an hour from New York City so I could spend the weekends in the city, I told myself. It is, of course, a bit strange to feel put upon about having to attend an Ivy League school, one of the best universities in the world, but I was a moody teenager in addition to carrying my secret, my trauma. I was in no position to face my privilege or how I took that privilege for granted. Hi, everyone. New folks joined. We're reading Hunger by Roxanne Gay. Content warning, she does talk about sexual violence and rape, as well as um, obesity and fatness. Um, so if that triggers you in any way, feel free to hop off. Or if you're watching this after it's been recorded, um, feel free to pause. Um, I'm going to read a couple more sections, heading to section three of this book. The chapters are very short, um, but wonderful. So... Um, we're going to go to chapter 31. When you're overweight, your body becomes a matter of public record in many respects. Your body is constantly and prominently on display. People project, assume narratives onto your body and are not at all interested in the truth of your body, whatever that truth might be. Fat, much like skin color, is something you cannot hide. No matter how dark the clothing you wear or how diligently you avoid horizontal stripes, you may become very adept at playing the role of wallflower. You may learn how to be the life of the party so that people are too busy laughing at or with you to focus on the elephant in the room. You may do whatever you have to do to survive a world that has little patience or compassion for a body like yours. Regardless of what you do, your body is the subject of public discourse with family, friends, and strangers alike. Your body is subject to commentary when you gain weight, lose weight, or maintain your unacceptable weight. People are quick to offer you statistics and information about the dangers of obesity as if you're not only fat, but also incredibly stupid unaware, delusional about the realities of your body in a world that is vigorously inhospitable to that body. This commentary is often couched as concern, as people only have your best interests at heart. They forget that you are a person. You are your body, nothing more, and your body should damn well become less. As a fat woman, I often see my existence reduced to statistics. As if with cold, hard numbers, our culture might make sense of what hunger can become. According to government statistics, the obesity epidemic costs between $147 and $210 billion a year. Though there is little clear information as to how researchers arrive at that overwhelming number. What exactly are the costs associated with obesity? The methodology is irrelevant. What matters is that fat is expensive and therefore a grave problem. Fat people are a drain on resources. What with needing health care and medication for all too human for their all too human bodies, many people act like fat people are reaching directly into their wallets. Uh, the fat of other people a burden on their personal bottom line. Statistics also reveal that 34.9% of Americans are obese and 68.6% .6 of Americans are obese or overweight. The definitions of overweight and obese are often vague and obscured by arbitrary measures like BMI or various other indexes. And this just in, the obesity epidemic has recently crossed the Atlantic Ocean and now many Europeans are falling prey to what is quickly becoming a pandemic an epidemic of global proportions. What matters most is that too many people are fat. The epidemic must be stopped by any means necessary. And I'm gonna move towards the beginning of the end. 
which is still kind of the middle because it's a big book. And I head to chapter 50. Once again, Roxanne Gay, uh, A Memoir of My Body. Roxanne Gay um, talks about her experience with sexual violence and fatness and obesity um, and uh, eating as one of her coping mechanisms in this book. So. I am terrified of other people. I am terrified of the way they are likely to look at me, stare, talk about me, or say cruel things to me. I am terrified of children, their guilelessness and brutal honesty and willingness to gawk at me and talk loudly about me, to ask their parents or sometimes even me, why are you so big? I'm terrified of the awkward pause of those children's parents as they try to respond appropriately. I do not have an answer to that question, or I do, and there simply isn't enough time or grace in the world to offer that answer up. And so I am terrified of other people. I hear the rude comments whispered. I see the stares and laughs and snickering. I see the thinly veiled or open disgust. I pretend I don't see it. I block it out as often as I can so I can live and breathe with some semblance of peace. The list of bullshit I deal with by virtue of my body is long and boring, and I am, frankly, bored with it. This is the world we live in. Looks matter. And we can say, but, 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 but no. Looks matter. Bodies matter. I could easily become a shut-in, hiding from the cruelty of the world. Most days it takes all my strength and no small amount of courage to get dressed and leave the house. If I don't have to teach or travel for work, I spend most of my time talking myself out of leaving my house. I can order something in. I can make do with what I have. Tomorrow, I promise myself, tomorrow I will face the world. If it's late in the week, there are several tomorrows until Monday. There are several tomorrows where I can lie to myself, when I can hope to build stronger defenses for facing the world that so cruelly faces me. I have two wardrobes. One, the clothes I wear every day is made up mostly of dark denim jeans, black t-shirts, and for special occasions, dress shirts. These clothes shroud my cowardice. These are the clothes I feel safe in. This is the armor I wear to face the world. And I assure you, armor is needed. I tell myself this armor is all I need. When I wear my typical uniform, it feels like safety like I can hide in plain sight. I become less of a target. I am taking up space, but I am doing so in an unamusing manner, so I'm less of a problem, less of a disturbance. This is what I tell myself. My other wardrobe, the one that dominates most of my closet, is full of the clothes I don't have the courage to wear. I am nowhere near as brave as people, as people believe me to be. As a writer, on but when I have to take my body out into the world, courage fails me. I am fat. I am six foot three. I take up space in nearly every way. I stand out when my nature is too very much want to disappear. But I love fashion. I love the idea of wearing color blouses with interesting cuts and silhouettes, something low cut that shows off my decollete. I have any number of fine dress slacks and I enjoy staring at them in my closet. So sleek and professional, so unlike me. I dream of wearing a long skirt or a maxi dress with bold bright stripes. My breath catches at the mere thought of wearing something sleeveless, bearing my brown arms. Fierce vanity smolders in the cave of my chest. I want to look good. I want to feel good. I want to be beautiful in this body I am in. The story of my life is wanting, hungering for what I cannot have, or perhaps wanting what I dare not allow myself to have. Many mornings, most mornings, I stand in my closet trying to figure out what I'm going to wear for the day. Really, this is part of an elaborate, exhausting performance in which the end result is always the same. But I have my delusions and I entertain them with alarming frequency and vigor. I try on various outfits and marvel at the cute clothes I own. If I am feeling particularly brave, I take a look at myself in the mirror. 
It's always surprising to see myself out of my usual clothes, to see how my body looks shrouded in color or something other than denim and cotton. Sometimes I decide on an outfit and leave my bedroom. It's a mundane moment, but for me, it is not. I decide, today I am a professional and I will look the part. I make breakfast or get my things together for work. I feel strange and awkward. In a matter of moments, it begins to feel like these unfamiliar clothes are strangling me. I see and feel every unflattering bulge and curve. My throat constricts. I can't breathe. The clothes shrink. Sleeves become tourniquets. Slacks become shackles. I start to panic, and before I know it, I'm tearing the bright, beautiful clothes off because I don't deserve to wear them. When I slide back into my uniform, that cloak of safety returns. I can breathe again. And then I start to hate myself for my unruly body that I seem incapable of disciplining for my cowardice in the face of what other people think. All right, I'm gonna head towards the end of the book. And um, we're gonna finish with chapter 88, which is the last chapter of the book. The chapter, like I mentioned before, does discuss um, content warning, rape, and sexual violence. Um, but hopefully you all will pick up this book and read the rest. It is a beautiful memoir. When I was 12 years old, I was raped. And then I ate and ate and ate to build my body into a fortress. I was a mess. And then I grew up and away from that terrible day and became a different kind of mess. A woman doing the best she can to love well and be loved well, to live well and be human and good. I am as healed as I am ever going to be. I have accepted that I will never be the girl I could have been if, if, if. I am still haunted. I still have flashbacks that are triggered by the most unexpected things. I don't like being touched by people with whom I do not share specific kinds of intimacy. I am suspicious of groups of men, particularly when I am alone. I have nightmares, though with far less frequency. I will never forgive the boys who rape me, and I am a thousand percent comfortable with that because forgiving them will not free me from anything. I don't know if I am happy, but I can see and feel that happiness is well within my reach. But I am not the same scared girl that I was. I have let the right ones in. I have found my voice. I am learning to care less what other people think. I am learning that the measure of my happiness is not weight loss, but rather feeling more comfortable in my body. I am increasingly committed to challenging the toxic cultural norms that dictate far too much of how women live their lives and treat their bodies. I'm using my voice, not just for myself, but for people whose lives demand being seen and heard. I have worked hard and I am enjoying a career I never dared think possible. I appreciate that at least some of who I am rises out of the worst day of my life and I don't want to change who I am. I no longer need the body fortress I built. I need to tear down some of the walls and I need to tear down those walls for me and me alone, no matter what good may come of that demolition. I think of it as an undestroying myself. Writing this book is the most difficult thing I've ever done. To lay myself so vulnerable has not been an easy thing to face myself and what living in my body has been like has not been an easy thing, but I wrote this book because it felt necessary. In writing this memoir of my body and telling you these truths about my body, I am sharing my truth and mine alone. I understand if that truth is not something you want to hear. The truth makes me uncomfortable too. But I am also saying, here is my heart, what's left of it. Here I am showing you the ferocity of my hunger. Here I am finally freeing myself to be vulnerable and terribly human. 
Here I am reveling in that freedom. Here, see what I hunger for and what my truth has allowed me to create. It's Roxanne Gay's hunger. Um, thank y'all so much for joining. I'm gonna stop there because I think it was a perfect place to end. For those of you who just popped in, um, this will be saved and on our um, IG, so you can come back and check it out. Um, we read Hunger, A Memoir of My Body by Roxanne Gay today. You can buy this book um, at The Raven, which is a local library if you're in Lawrence, Kansas, um, or check any of your local libraries if you happen to be um, in another state. Um, thank y'all so much for joining. Please check out Emily Taylor Center. Um, we're on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Um, you can check out our website. It is under construction, but you can still visit it. Um, and happy first week of school. Um, talk to you all soon. Bye.